You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where every week my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special weekly guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Always appreciated. And also, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. You can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com, or as you can see on the YouTube version of the podcast, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guest this week, Trish Campbell. Let me tell you a little bit about Trish. Trish is an author, creative, and Reiki master, and a healing and transformation coach. She is a newly published author of Love Me, Awakening to Healing, Self-Love, and Liberation. Under her brand, This is Trish, she supports awakening individuals on their own journey of self-love and self-alchemy, the evolving process of remembering their truth and who they came here to be. Trish's intuitive gifts are the foundation of her business, providing the space for healing and breakthroughs, whether in personal life or business, and giving consistent voice to brands for entrepreneurs through intuitive marketing solutions. Her vision for humanity is to help individuals cultivate a deep, loving relationship with their soul that ultimately strengthens all their relationships, romantic, family, workplace, and so on, and spread the message of love me, love you, love us through podcasts, public speaking, and workshops. Trish, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, David. I'm so honored to be here with you. Oh, you're so sweet. I'm so happy to have you here. So for those of you that are typical listeners, I always start my podcast with the same question, then I end the podcast with the same question, a different question, but at the end. But let me start off with this. Tell the listeners and viewers, in the the case of the YouTube version, how you and I met. We met through the Cornelia Stephanie Media Group, the KS Media Group. We have uh, an app, but we have a mastermind and we meet originally, I think we were meeting once a month and now we're meeting five times a month. And it's really this beautiful community where we're collaborating and getting to know each other. We're growing in all different ways in personal life and in business and just really supporting each other, especially as entrepreneurs. It's it's tough sometimes doing this alone and and we're not alone we're doing this together and it's such a beautiful space and we've met amazing people I've met amazing people just like you and getting to work with others and expand and grow and all the things so yeah yeah, it's it's been an incredible ride thank you and I appreciate those comments and I would say a word that came up for me Uh, When I think about this wonderful community group, and as you mentioned, the app that we're doing now and so forth, and as it's expanded and grown and so on. But the word I probably use more than anything else in the last year and a half, maybe two years, is like-minded. I'm just fascinated, just even reading your bio about just how like-minded the people in the group, you, me, and other uh, podcasters and other members are, which is really neat. So speaking about that journey, I always think it's interesting. I always assume the typical listener doesn't necessarily know that gratitude guy or one of my guests, in this case, Chris Campbell. So I like to kind of back up a little bit and talk a little bit about the journey, maybe not, maybe not high school age, but college age type thing. Talk about how you started out and what were some of your earlier directions that you had maybe in your early mid twenties as you were just starting out. Sure. And that kind of ties into my book and what the foundation of that is too. So I'm glad you're bringing that up. Um, yeah, I, I was somebody who always wanted to be, do, take, do the right thing, do, you know, check society's boxes and all in order and be the good girl, quote unquote. And so I went, you know, went to university and then, uh, I studied, um, 
French and marketing. I wanted to be a French teacher, but then met my now ex-husband and ended up moving to Canada. I'm originally from Michigan. So, you know, my original plans kind of changed and ended up living in Canada and um, not working for the first five or six years after I got married and having kids. And, and then so started my career late because I wanted to spend that quality time raising my kids in their early years and so really fell into marketing and sales and using a little bit of the French but really realized that I was you know I was I was like I said checking all the boxes outwardly looking successful feeling successful but also feeling this emptiness like something was missing no matter how much I achieved no matter how much progress I made in my career the promotions the the, the salaries the titles whatever I was, I felt like something was, was missing. And then um, eventually uh, on a side note, like I, I had a divorce and went off and in, in on my own and continued in that career path. But really it wasn't until a few years later where um, I was in another relationship and I ended, um, that ended and that started me on this journey back to find myself again, because in all those checking of all the boxes, I'd forgotten to check my own, mm -hmm. I realized. And so I forgot who I was in all of that, because I was so busy making sure everyone else was happy with the way that I was living my life. I think, that's, that's, such, yeah. I think that's such a good point, because I think uh, I always wanted to do the right things and checking all the boxes. And I think for me, I had a similar epiphany, probably around 24, 25 years old, which was I had grown up, I got, went to junior high school, I went to high school, I went to college, I got married, I bought a house, I didn't have kids back then, married my mm -hmm. high school sweetheart, and then at about 24, 25, and I remember thinking, what am I supposed to do now? Because I'm, yeah. I'm doing everything that everybody thinks you're supposed to do, you know, when you're supposed to get married, you're supposed to have kids, you're supposed to buy a house, you're supposed to get a car, you know, whatever. So what was, was there an epiphany around that? Or how is it that you kind of got a hold of that and maybe got a little different direction going? Yeah, I mean, it started coming before I left my marriage and I was married for 17 years, well, ultimately 20. Um, but then it it really, I started thinking what it, yeah, what what next? Like what else is there? What, there's gotta be something more. And I started on this, my own spiritual journey and, and looking for that, seeking that. And, and um, it wasn't until I would say the pivotal moment uh, for me in getting to me to where I am right now is was the ending of that relationship I had after my marriage, which I thought was going to be forever. And it wasn't. And when that was end, when that ended, I realized I had built my whole life inside in somebody else. Like I had built mm -hmm. my home in someone else and not inside of myself. And so everything was like stripped away. And I was like left with nothing, it felt like. And I really also noticed that this was a pattern for me in relationships. So I wanted to explore that and not just put the blame on somebody else, but look, really look at how I contributed to that, the patterns that I was like having showing up in relationships a certain way and why that was. And I, and so then it took me, like I said, back to my childhood to kind of connect the dots mm -hmm. in, in what, how I, why I ended up showing up that way, why I was in my adult life showing up in this kind of like people pleasing, giving up pieces of myself to be loved and accepted. Um, and, you know, uh, just like, yeah, stripping away parts of myself to fit in, in whatever space it might be. Yeah, that is, and you know, and I think as I hear you say that, um, I built my home inside somebody else and then there's this a pattern in my life. Um, I think maybe men, some men go down some of the similar roads, but I just think that women in particular, at least been, it's been my experience, um, very much are sometimes in this subservient role where I'm supposed to do what the husband says or what my father said I was supposed to be as a young lady, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. So when you were able to recognize that and break that pattern, how do you then, because I know you're a coach as well, but then how do you help people kind of identify that and maybe make some changes and what steps do they maybe do? Because I have a feeling there's a number of women in particular that could be listening to this that would say, boy, that's me. I went down the same road as, as Trish. What right. are some things that you help them to identify and how they can snap out of that, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's been a journey and finding different ways to, um, to explore that and different tools to use, but really it comes down to um, 
the the short the the shortcut version is is to go back to that child who maybe wasn't received the way that she was showing up naturally. So my my little Trisha inside was being received. The first first um, interaction and and kind of experiences we have is with our family. And when you're not you show up as your natural self and you're not you're told you're not this or you're not that. And, and then you start to feel this sort of, okay, I'm not loved this way. So how can I be loved and start to shape? I started to shape probably subconsciously uh, myself around the way that I was loved and accepted. So, you know, and then that just kind of like built on itself and evolves into, you know, I called myself a well-groomed people pleaser uh, and that, you know, that's how it showed up in adulthood. And so really it was going back to, um, my inner child and we all have that. That's, you know, it's our core wounds that end up being where we're operating a lot of our times in our, in our, in our day-to-day -day life, where if, they're, if we're not healing those wounds and we might think, oh, I'm good. I, you know, I can deal with, I can manage life with this hurt that I felt back when I was in, in high school or, earlier childhood or whenever it is, whatever trauma it is that, you know, we, we hold that in our entire lives if we're not healing it. And then that begins to be the place where we're operating from. So we snap at the Uber driver or we, you know, lash out at the pizza delivery person because we're, we're operating from this wounded place that isn't really who we are, but it's because our, what's happening in the current moment is triggering a past wound. And so it really was important to me to go back and really give my inner child what she didn't get when she was that, you know, younger self. Yeah. And I think also if we can use your life as an example, mm -hmm. I'm always kind of curious, um, I guess if it's negative with any parents, I don't want to take shots at anybody, but, but how was the growing up experience in terms of brothers and sisters and firstborn, mm -hmm. lastborn, middle child? Was it, would, would you consider it somewhat normal or were there things that you look back that really affected how this uh, well-groomed people pleaser came out of all this? Yeah, it's interesting you ask because, and nobody's really asked me that question. So I love that you asked me that because that's a big part of it. I think I had a really stable uh, childhood as far as like my parents um, providing that stability of, you know, we, we grew up probably middle class and, you know, it, it, we had a, a lot of stability, relatively speaking, but I was a twin. I'm a twin. Mm. So there was this constant, um, and I think when people see twins, the first thing is, oh, who's who, you know, trying to tell who, you know, trying to tell us apart. And so there's this automatic comparison between the two of us always, like people, I think, feel like they have a free ticket to say, well, you're that you're like chubbier. So I was always the chubbier one. I was always the, oh. you know, and so it became a place of like, so I'm going to protect myself. I'm just going to, you know, kind of make sure everyone knows I'm the chubbier one before somebody says it and hurts me. So I kind of, you know, build that protection around myself with making sure nobody says anything to me that I don't already know my, I haven't heard a thousand times. And those things become like, it might be one time it's, you can brush it off, but if you keep hearing it over and over again, um, and keep having that co constant comparison, it starts to become part of who you are mm -hmm. and it breeds competition, especially between twins. So there was, um, we were each other's best friend and, but also there was a lot of, you know, probably subconscious competition that, carried into our adulthood and um unnecessarily so there's 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 a lot of pieces of that that um you know play a part in me wanting to make everybody happy because I wanted to be perceived as good always as the good one and um yeah that almost is like some another angle that you've given me to uh explore because there's so many layers to and you know, I'm glad we're talking about this to going back and healing. And it's always like, we think, okay, I, I dealt with that. I, I sat with that inner child who didn't get the love from a parent or whatever that she, that she wanted, but then there's other layers to that. So we can always come back and another perspective and heal some more. It's never finished. Right. So I'm glad well, you're, you're bringing that up because it's an ongoing process. It's, sure. it's, well, and I think also one of the things that's neat when people talk about their stories is that we just don't realize that you know, there's certain people that have had an existence like it just would never occur to me what it would be like to be a twin. 
Yeah. You know, I, I have three brothers and a sister. We're all really different and so forth. But but you just made a comment that I just never would have thought about that before. But this automatic, then uh, sort of almost instantaneous comparison. Oh, you're the chubby yeah. one. Oh, you're the smart one. You're the one. So because mm -hmm. you're twins, they're going to try to find some differences and things. And so you mentioned that she was your best friend. How was your yeah. relationship with uh, your twin today? Um, well, we... <sighs> You can't personal, David. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that does. So, you know, we've had our challenges and, uh, you know, my book is very personal and it tells, I tell my story. Um, so there's some, there, there's been some challenges with our, with our relationship in adulthood because of all of the wounding that happened when we were children and that sense of, um, and it showed up in other ways too. Like she had her own experience where maybe I was the one who got the better grades because, you know, she had a, a teacher who didn't teach her what she needed to learn, you know, for three years down the road in high school or something like that. So yeah. there, there, there's this, this sense of identity that we needed to find that we, we had a difficulty navigating because there's another layer to it. Everyone also wanted to pair, put us as one person, the twins, mm -hmm. never, right. you know, Trisha and Tracy and is seen as individuals. So, you know, that's a lot of, um, of of wounding and and you know negative emotional experience to unpack and to heal and we each have our own journeys and um dealing with it in different ways and so that kind of you know brings us to some some challenges in in our communication and our relationship but it's you know it's an ongoing process to heal and we have our individual parts and our parts that we need to work together yeah. And obviously, when I asked that question, I had no idea what relationship you had with her today, except that you're best friends when you were younger. Yeah. I've seen somebody gave me an analogy. It was on a whole different thing, but it comes to mind about somebody said when, when I was working at Nordstrom and, and a person would get upset about a problem that hadn't be like a balloon, the slowly the balloon would grow, blow way, way, way up. And if you just said, I'll give you your money back and wouldn't let them vent, it's just like popping the balloon and it blows the whole thing. And it's just it, the air needs to come out the same way it came mm -hmm. in. So yeah. think about the, the with Tracy and this, it gets blown to this big thing. If it's ever going to get unpacked, the word that you use that we use a lot these days, but it's got to come out slow and it can't just, yeah. be, you just can't, well, I'm sorry for everything I did to you pop, you know, and it's got to, and there's something about that analogy and I like it. And, and I'm sure it would be over the conversations you've had with her, just using her as your twin sister. I find so interesting because people will say to me, and I, I think about letting that balloon go, all the air come out. And even if you hadn't said anything and they just vent and they just let it slowly back out because it came in slowly. Mm -hmm. Fascinating how, how many people will go, thank you for listening. I feel so much better. And you haven't said anything. Yeah. You just listen and let them say, let me tell you about my experiences. The other half of you, Tracy, the other half of you, Trish, and see as an example. And I just think it's, it's just such another great example of how if we listen effectively and communicate effectively, how much we can progress from things from our childhood. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I've been practicing being that better listener and uh, really just witnessing and allowing that other person to, whether it's my sister or whoever, but I hope that we have that opportunity to sit in that, uh, in both of us being in a more um, evolved space emotionally to, uh, I mean, I love her. So I want to heal that 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 rift that we have in our relationship and um you know it's just part of the human journey it's part of our soul's journey as well to to have these um experiences that bring us maybe some discomfort but there's some wisdoms in there for us to learn about ourselves and how to be better in relationship with each other so i'm 100 percent willing to go there in 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 total humility and and taking accountability for my my part in that so yeah well, and as you say you cover i got i got about halfway through your book you cover a lot of that in your book yeah. which i think is really really brave and and it i, I don't see it any other way if people are going to be full of baloney or not tell the real story it doesn't really communicate authentically and yeah. it really does and stuff but but along that line too as we before we get to the books i want to spend some time on that what talk about what you did kind of for work when you you talk about the 17 yeah. 20 year relationship and a couple of kids and things like that but what was kind of your work journey along that time yeah so another interesting uh journey of trying to fit in a place I didn't really feel like I felt fit in I I, I like I said I went to I 
studied French and marketing. And so I got a job um, in sales and marketing. It was always a hybrid role of sales and marketing, but funny enough, like I ended up spending most of my career in a male dominated industry. So selling power tools, and I was usually the only woman on the sales team. So I was always trying to fit in that space. I think that was the lesson I needed to learn was to, um, you know, navigate this. And it was, it brought me to that in conjunction with being a twin in conjunction with a relationship that ended that I had built you know, my, my home inside of this other person, but being in that space, it was, you know, again, a, an experience of like being told, well, you're not suited for sales or you're not, because I wasn't the right personality for sales, for example. And so I got to this place where I was like, so frustrated with having to show up a certain way that I'm like, I want to do something about this. So I left the corporate world. Well, kind of was, we'll just say spit out twice. And, um, and uh, which is all part of the journey. And I'm not, you know, embarrassed to admit that that's a, a lot of people can probably relate to that. And I, I really was in a place where I, my identity wasn't attached to um, the job that I did, although I was very passionate, very, I treated it like my own business always, and always was very successful. So I was always like, why is this happening? Why when as soon as I achieve a success, I'm out. And so it was kind of this validation of I wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. you know, a validation of my unworthiness of and being told you're not suited for this, you should not be here and kind of being then that setting the stage for me to be booted out. And and so it really brought me to a place of, I want to make, and, and, and in that space too, I will say that I noticed um, I wasn't the only one that was frustrated that everyone had their own reasons for being, you know, not maybe necessarily happy in the place, the places where I worked because the cultures were not conducive to us, anybody showing up as themselves. I mean, you know, we have to walk in the door and turn off parts of ourselves that were that are part of our humanity like for example if you had well if you had blue hair David <laughs> or you know an ear piercing or something that might make you unproductive I mean that you know all these things that are not accepted socially in the workplace that are really part of our creative expression which are then also it's part of our creative expression, but it's also the connection to our soul, who we are at our core. So we're turning off parts of ourselves to go into a workplace and then expected to perform at 100% all the time when we're fractions of ourselves. Right. And so I started to see this in you know my own journey, but then on the on the collective scale, like what why is it this way? And it shouldn't be this way. Why is it not? Why are we not allowed to be our authentic self in the workplace? We're not, you know, allowed to be our whole self. And so I really went, you know, when I was outside of the corporate world, I'm like, I want to make an, an impact in that way. And it started to me um, coaching and consulting others in their career moves to find, you know, better fits culturally speaking or you know, doing something they love and getting paid for it, but also evolving through my own healing journey, it's turned into me wanting to take this healing work that I've done on a personal level. And I work with clients on a personal level into the corporate space and do corporate healing because it is one of the most um, toxic environments, collectively speaking. I mean, there's some good work places out there that are progressive and really put an emphasis on their employees' well-being. But it's really uh, a missed opportunity for a lot of companies to um, to have an edge, a competitive edge, if that's what their goal is, to to uh, leverage their best asset, which is their employees, and to make sure that those that asset is well functioning together and individually. Right. So that's you know really the work that this this journey has led me to. I mean, I've always wanted to do that, and now this my book. I want to take that message into the to the workplace eventually. And when did you start that? How long ago? Um, well, I started wanting to do the corporate work before I wrote the book, so probably maybe in the last five years. But as I've written the book, and I think this really could be a message that can be something that 
can work. I think we're finally getting there into a place with with the pandemic. It opened up and opened up a door to our humanity when people were on Zoom calls and the dogs running in, or the kids are yelling in the background, or something. We're showing up with shorts on the bottom and a you know dress shirt on the top or whatever. So it's it, it opened a door for bringing that humanity in, and that's what. Um, so it's really been in the last year that I've been developing the language to speak to corporate. And I've actually done some corporate work, healing, doing my Reiki work in the corporate space, doing meditations as well. So, uh, and just bringing that in um, and calling in more of that, because I yeah. think it's necessary. And that provides kind of a nice segue. I mentioned we were going to spend some time on the book. The mm -hmm. book is called Love Me. And I think that you just said something about honoring yourself and, and appreciating who you were and not living for other people's lives and expectations. Mm -hmm. There's a great um, list of five things. They call it the five regrets of the dying. And it's people that were interviewed in their 90s. And what are the regrets they had now that they're pretty much near the end? And, and one of them was, I wish I had lived a life more true to myself than what others expected of me. Yeah. And you know, there's other ones too, like I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I stayed better in touch with friends, things like that. But I really like that one about living a life truer to themselves because I sometimes feel like from my perspective that we have this, before I knew the word pandemic, I, I thought it was an epidemic of lack of self-esteem and lack of self-confidence. It just seems to be pervasive. It seems like everybody has it. People act out in the strangest ways by uh, because they don't feel good about themselves. And they say things, and I, I guess you know I have a Ferrari and thing. It just, it's just crazy. Why are you saying, I don't care what your car is or whatever. Yeah. But, but going into, so this, so that's why it's so perfect for the book, Love Me, because it really does. I talk in one of my modules in my talk about the relationship with you have with yourself, I think is the most important relationship you'll ever going to have. And yes. that's maybe your spiritual connection. So, so let's talk about and, and give the listeners a little idea of the book and, and how has it started and some of the key aspects of that. This is the book, by the way, I just want to hold it up for people watching on YouTube. Um, yeah. So like I said, this book started, um, at the end of a relationship and when I realized I had built my home inside of somebody else and I you know always thought and I think a lot of people I've heard the same thing we think we love ourselves we think we, you know we're good or but it's 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 really the most important relationship we have and um I re I realized at that point that I wasn't loving myself I had done the opposite which is self-abandonment mm -hmm. I had abandoned myself and I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, and it's so, we're so conditioned and programmed to abandon ourselves because it's always about putting everyone else first and we're always last on the list. But this is changing that paradigm and that that mindset of, because it really is our relationship with ourself, I think you said it, determines how we relate with others, how the quality of the relationships we have with others, because we know how we are, we understand ourselves better, we have the self-awareness, it's all part of loving yourself, the self-awareness, the self-reflection, the humility, the accountability, the integrity, all of those things are part of that self-love journey, and so that's why I felt it was so important because I realized in that moment when I when that relationship ended and everything was gone that I didn't have any I wasn't acting in integrity I wasn't in alignment with who I was I wasn't not that I wasn't living authentically or that I was showing up fake but I wasn't really being myself I was making sure I was um it was more about making sure that everyone was happy like I said with me and how I was living my life and not necessarily um, embracing my imperfections. And I think that's another part of our societal conditioning where we think we have to be perfect in everything. And so then we have, you know, it relates to our lack of self-worth and we're inherently imperfect as humans and that should be embraced. And that's our uniqueness, you know, as individuals. So I think it's all, all of those things are part of the equation of coming back to that love for self and remembering who we are and why I say remembering is because we knew when we came here who we were supposed to be. We knew the, the journey our soul was meant to take, but we soon forget because all the noise outside of us, we take that on. We take on those stories that other people say, oh, you're this or you're that. You're not suited for sales. You're so I'm like, okay, I'm not, you know, those things become reals in our mind mm -hmm. and, and self-doubt where we're in a, when we're in a vulnerable place, we, we tend to go to. So Love me was at first a, a, a plea, 
like love me, which then throughout the journey turned into a declaration. I love me. Yeah. Like really be really standing in that, that love. And it's really, it goes back to that self-esteem thing, which I get, I just can't get over how people act out and and when they don't have good self-esteem. And Mm -hmm. I look at the, as far as I got into the book, kind of a memoir in a lot of ways and and Mm -hmm. different things you went through, would you classify as a lot of the book is kind of a self-help book too for others? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, it's categorized under self help. It's also categorized under poetry, because a lot Mm -hmm. of I would say 50% of it, if not more is poetry, I think I have about 90 poems in there. And that's really where the book started when I, at, like I said, at the end of that relationship, part of my healing process was writing, and writing poetry. And then I, I remembered that I had always wanted to write a book that I had kind of shoved that on the back burner thought, you know, I remember that dream when I was in high school. I'm like, I really, what would it be like to be a published author? And back then it was so much harder. So it was a further, a dream that was further away, but now, you know, it's so much easier to do that. So I was like, I'm going to take this poetry and put it in a book, but I was like, I need to put context to it because without the context of the insights and the story, um, and I thought then it be evolved into this, I'm sharing my healing journey to help not just, you know, it's healing for me, but it's also going to help other people because I know other people, while their experiences might be different, there, there's parallels there and they'll be able to draw those and reflect on their own. And that's exactly what's happening with the feedback I'm getting from people is it, it's, it's taking people, they're taking their time with it to digest and self-reflect and pause and and, you know, dog earing it to come back to for these lessons and really processing their emotions, which is so, uh, I just, I mean, that was the reason why I shared it in the way that I did was to not just, not just tell my story, but to help others as well. Well, and process emotions. I wrote an article, I wrote a lot of stuff for my uh, Friday focus on gratitude and Monday morning men and LinkedIn. And I wrote an article recently called undigested grief. Yeah. And sometimes there's things you, it has to be processed. Things need to be processed. Yeah. And I think for the benefit of those that haven't read the book or may not read it for a bit, do you have an idea of like what you could say, or here's two or three steps I recommend for people that have been kind of going down that path of, of not loving themselves? Yeah. I mean, first of all, have grace for yourself, hold the space and just um, allow yourself to be and allow yourself some compassion. I mean, that I forgot to say that too, is is part of the self-love equation is that compassion for yourself, because we all have been through a lot. Like we all have our different degrees of trauma or negative experiences in life and childhood or adulthood or whatever, but really allow yourself that space just to um, hold yourself in that. And for me, and I guess like one of the most important things was to rediscover myself and go back to, you know, do things that maybe you once liked and put on the side. Um, Creativity was a big part of healing. So I encourage anybody to, if they're, if they're looking for a place to start is to start doing something creative, whether it's writing or some sort of artwork or some sort of craft like pottery or um, my son does wood carving. So I'm thinking of that, but that's almost a meditative process in and of, of itself. And it helps you reconnect with who you are and um, remind you of, you know, it just gives you that space to learn more about yourself mm-hmm. and, and discover what you like and discover how you need to be loved. And I think that's so important in relationships because we can't expect anyone else to love us if we don't know how, how we need to be loved, what we need. So it's important. And I think we've got it uh, backwards in society where we think it's selfish to focus on ourselves, but if we don't know that about ourselves, then, you know, we're always going to have that challenge communicating that in our relationship. Yeah. And I think as I'm writing down these steps here, that just kind of as, as I always mentioned on the podcast, some tips and takeaways from each guest and stuff, and I'll cover those in just a few minutes as we wrap up. But I think it, it almost sounds like a dichotomy. On the one hand, I say that it's amazing to me um, how people just are lack self-esteem, lack self-confidence, and, oh, I, I just think I'm a terrible person. It seems to be so, so pervasive. But then on the other hand, in the next breath, I'll admit that I think people are incredibly hard on themselves. Right. And, just, and I'm just looking, have grace for yourself, allow for some space, have compassion for yourself. I love to do something creative. 
uh, and discover how we need to be loved. I mean, it's it's just amazing. I mean, and, and I'll, I'll I'll raise my hand and, and say there's sometimes you haven't accomplished enough. You need to do this. Mm. And you, you know, it's like, but and that's why I love the word grace. Give yes. yourself some grace. Oh my goodness. And part of the whole thing with gratitude, in fact, I should ask you, um, how has gratitude played a part mm. in your life and in, in your, your journey? Yeah, I love that. Um, so I mean, gratitude is part of it too. And I can't believe I didn't mention that, but probably because I knew you were going to ask me or assumed you would. Um, yeah, it's been, it's, it's such a healing, it's such a grounding place to be in gratitude. I think um, you can turn the most simplest thing into a gratitude practice. Like, I think I even write about it in my book, my coffee um, ritual in the morning, um, every morning, you know, just the way I make it I'm with the mocha pot on the stove. And that just, that is my, you know, gratitude ritual. And just these little things, um, gratitude uh, is like this um, energy shifter or mindset shifter. If you're feeling in a low place, or if you're feeling low vibration or just like not in a dark place, like the, the, one of the best ways to get out of it is to start finding gratitude for the things that you do have or that, um, and it came to me the other day, like, you know, look at what is and not what isn't and mm -hmm. be grateful for that. And yeah. that is, you know, and it, and it really is, I look at it as the contrast. So the, the things, the negative or the, the, the um, lack of something is really to show us what we what we do want in life and it really is you know a different perspective to look at it that way and not look at what isn't there but what is there and be grateful it's such a beautiful foundation to be operating from in our lives as you know well i like that too look at what it is uh look at what it is and not what it isn't mm -hmm. and um that may be a monday morning minute here in the next yeah. week, so watch out for that but okay good no, that, and it's so true and i gratitude is obviously a huge part of my world and and i've told people that are having all sorts of struggles uh are you writing in your gratitude journal well no i used to or i don't or i will well i said well you know when you take five minutes every day it's all it takes and you frame everything around what you have versus what you don't have it's almost impossible to go down the wrong path because right. you're the things you have and you're not worried about and you're not i call it comparisonitis when people are always comparing themselves to other people and i saw a word the other day body dysmorphia these mm. poor women go through this and being you know thinking their bodies are terrible or whatever and, and gosh i mean you know, as somebody once said to me the only person you should compare yourself is to who you were yesterday yeah, try to be a better version of that. So, yes. um, well, we've got to wrap up. And so this is this has been fantastic. And I'm going to just I want to go through these one more time, just these couple of tips too, before I ask you my last question. But I really like this because it, you're, you so much of what we talk about you talk knowing you, Trish, and knowing in the book too about kind of the human condition. I mean, how we see ourselves and what about that relationship with the person in the mirror and, and how we take some good things from our childhood and maybe uh, process, as you said earlier, some of the, the not so good things from our childhood. But um, with, with such great reminders, have grace for yourself, allow for some space. That's just such a great one as well. Compassion for yourself, having compassion, gosh, compassion, grace, uh, do something creative. I think that's really, really cool. That's just having an outlet. There's something that can give you a whole other aspect of your brain that gets to work and then discover how we need to be loved uh, versus looking at it from the outside. So, uh, and then grounding into gratitude. So, uh, excellent. So my last question, Ms. Campbell is always the same one as well is what do you know today that you would like to have known at 18 that would have helped you? That I was enough, that I'm always enough. That as simple as that. I think, yeah, you, you, you said something earlier that made me think of our society is so um, materialistic value oriented. And so we're always needing to produce to, pr to prove our worth. And so, we're already worthy. We're inherently worthy from the moment we arrive here. Yeah. And so that is like the thing I would, I would, that I would say, I know now that I was enough. Yeah. And it's so important. And I just, and I, I'm not uh, alone on this. And, and I, I just, sometimes I, I'll do a talk and, and I walk off the stage and I don't know if the talk's more for the audience or for me, every time I do the talk, it reminds mm -hmm. me of being grateful and so forth, but this constant hammering that you're not enough, you need to be better. You need to get this. If it was a B, it wasn't good enough. It was an A. If it was not, it was A plus. If it was not an A plus, it was the teacher gave you an apple, you know, or, or yeah. something. And it's just crazy. So that is very, very good advice. Well, thank you so much. 
And let me tell the audience and the listeners um, a couple of things I mentioned earlier. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. And I do know that people are struggling with a lot of issues, as I mentioned earlier, all sorts of life issues, anxiety, depression, jobs, health, family, financial, and so forth. And I have a gratitude coaching program that can propel you to achieve anything your mind can conceive. And clients report back to me that dramatically shortens their learning curve and they get a detailed, uh, derailed life rather back on track. So I offer a complimentary 30 minute coaching consultation to offer you some on the spot coaching and see if I might be able to help. If you're interested in that, you can text me at 206-371-8309. And in the message box, just put the word coach. And for additional information on my keynote speaking, it's at thatgratitudeguy.com. And also one last thing, people like to receive my Monday morning minute. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. If you'd like to get that, go to your text on your phone and text it to the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and hit send, and it'll have you a link that you can sign up and get that. So, so thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate the listeners and viewers. And remember, as I always say, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.